Okay, welcome everybody. Um, the next talk will be How Hackers Grind an MMORPG by Taking It Apart, an introduction to reverse engineering network protocols. So, and now I would, I'd like, you, uh, would, now I would like you to give a very warm and welcoming applause to our very nice speaker, Rink Springer. Oh, thank you. I'm uh, here to talk about how, how to grind an MMORPG. If you don't know what an MMORPG is, I, won't, I will get into that shortly. But just for reference, who does not know what an MMORPG is? Never heard of it. <laughs> wow, amazing. <laughs> OK, well, then I will get this show on the road. I'm Rink Springer. I'm a software engineer. And if you want to know something else, I have a web page which I, which I encourage you to visit. So what am, I, what, what am I going to talk about? I will first give a short introduction about the game I decided to, uh, well, to look into, Hoons of Magic. Who has heard of this game? Uh, well, that's a lot more people than I expected, to be honest. I heard it's quite popular here in Germany, but well, you never know. So I'm going to briefly touch it and mainly to, to, to tell you why it's interesting to look at a game like this. I will also tell you my motivation, and then we will get right into the technical stuff. And I'm going to, show, to tell you how I captured traffic and I started poking at it, looking at it, analyzing it. I've written tools to help me, and I've also talked to a lawyer because, well, it's a, it's a strange world this time. So well, I wanted to be sure I was safe. And after that, was time for some Q&A. So, but first, I want to thank some people. The first person is someone who has a blog about Runes of Magic research. As far as I know, he never released something, but when I, when I was really like, I, I'm stuck, I mailed him. He had a really good, helpful reply, so I was like, oh, thank you. Uh, the FDB extractor is a very nice tool which I will cover in a. Uh, I will cover it, so don't worry. But I'm happy it exists. The reason I'm giving this talk is because the previous year there was a talk about cyber necromancy, about reverse engineering dead protocols, and I was like, well, that's interesting. If people are interested in that sort of stuff, maybe maybe I should contribute to this as well because it is about protocols, and in this case, the server is still live. But on the other hand, this game is really not true. So, well, as I said, I talked to lawyers. Arnold Engelfried is a Dutch lawyer who's a really friendly guy, and I can highly recommend his blog. In fact, he, he will, be, he will be, be writing something about, about my questions and about his view on the matter on his blog. So if you can read Dutch, Google his name, and you will find it. And of course, no, nothing is complete without Ida and Oli DBG. If you haven't heard of the tools, I'm not sure what you're doing here because they were really good and you should check them out. So, but first, what is an MMORPG? Oh, it's an abbreviation, and you can read it. But what it basically means is it's an online game. And the online game means you have a character and it's usually something of a fantasy theme, an elf, uh, a wizard, or who knows what. And the, the idea of these games is that they are subscription-based or free-to-play. So in the first case, you pay every month a certain amount. And in the other, and in the other part, you, just, you, can, you can play it for free, but there are microtransactions to, yeah, to ensure that developers can eat. The goal of the game is to create a virtual character, like this elf wizard or whatever, and you improve it. And you improve it by, by gaining levels, by finding items, gear, if you will, by completing quests, because quests give you levels, typically. And, and the, main, the main reason to play this game is because you want to get stronger. You want to do more content. You want, you, yeah, you, you want to do stuff. You want to show the world your virtual person is interesting. And the game is socially involved, there's team play involved. You can't do, generally do stuff by, us, by yourself. You need others. You need friends. And well, what level of friendship you need is uh, an entire different matter, but you can't do it alone. And secondly, these games are designed to suck up time. They are designed to get you coming back. They really want you to, to get in the world, and they want you to keep playing in. And you can do it by playing, but you can also do it with different means, which I will show you now. 
So what does the game look like? The game I'm covering, it looks like this. If you've never played it before, it's old by now, but who knows? It's free to play, so, so you, can, you can just go out, download it, install it, you can do whatever you want with it. Well, that's what I did anyway. Uh, it has a Taiwanese developer and a German publisher, and you really see it back in the, in the, in the way the game is created, because the term grinding means you, you repeat some activity over and over again. And that's exactly what they do, and uh, I've heard Taiwanese developers, Asians really, are really love this stuff, and this game does it quite well. So, what does this game offer? A really, really quick quick you know, in line, if you will. You have three races, human elves, dwarves, you have a lot of classes. The interesting part about this game is you can play a wizard warrior, and that, that unique combination gives you seven or skills. And I find it is interesting, and it is one of the things that dream me to this game. You can do crafting, and instance is like a team level, if you will, where you can join up together and destroy monsters and whatnot to get the items you need to process. And you can do really interesting things with the items here. You can customize them in any way you want. Well, if there's a pet system, you can have a pet. You have a, you have, you have a house, you can do all sorts of things. And all this stuff is encoded in a protocol. And I was wondering, how the hell does it work? So, to give you an idea, what, what stands here is not important. The idea is the item to the left is, is what you find, and item to the right is what you can create of it. So, what this means is the left thing is you, you're lucky if you find it, let's put that first, but you can't use it. It, it does nothing, it's useless. And the item to the right, you can enhance it, and, you can, and it is useful. The item to the right is what you would use if you played this game like I have a year and a half ago or something. So, why did I intend to do this? I, I was curious. I mean, this was the first MMORPG I ever touched. Spoiler alert, it's going to be the last, because first things really suck up time. But I was wondering, how does it work? What does it make a stick? And I was like, it's my PC. You give me an executable phone and, and 15 gigs of data. What does it do on my PC? What does it send out? What's my, what's, I wanted to know, does it send something of my configuration? I was like, hmm. This is interesting to figure out. And of course, the time is now because, well, the game is active now, so you can capture whatever traffic you want. You can, yeah, you can basically, you can just do whatever you want. And if they decide to, yeah, to take the servers online, it's much and much harder. So I was like, I'm going to do this now. And to be honest, also, I got bored of playing the game. So I was like, what the hell? Let's just, let's just take it apart. So the first step you need to do is you need to capture packets. I don't, I was like, how am I going to do this without the game knowing what I'm going to do? And the reason I was, some games essentially contain things like rootkits. They scan your memory, they scan your DLLs, they do whatever they want to figure out that you're playing the game as intended. And I was like, mm, I don't know how good those developers are. I don't, I don't know what they're sending. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take another computer for my hardware the problem, and I'm just going to capture on it. So you have this tool TCP dump, I'm sure everyone knows it. And there's also a nice tool called TCP flow. And what it does is you can just insert your dump file from TCP dump in TCP flow and you get a text file with the TCP data. And that's really useful because I don't like reading TCP headers myself. So what you do is it looks like this. You can just uh, tell TCP dump to dump everything from a certain network into a file. And it's really useful to filter on a network because you don't want DNA, DNS requests and whatever to your own systems to be logged. You just want to dump everything that goes to the network of the publisher. And the, the nice part is you can use Whois to find out what the range is. So you really know quite fast what's interesting and what is not. And then you, you call TCP dump on this capture phone. You just say, OK, let's, uh, let's look at the file and you obtain with something like the stuff below. So what it does is it has a source IP, destination IP, and two ports, and it just shows, okay, this is the data of that, of what I found. It's really simple. Well, if we look at, uh, when, I, when I'm logging into the game, you get something like this. And if you look at it, you're like, hmm, that's a lot of data, huh? But the important thing you start to note, I started to notice, there's a lot of zeros in there, right? I mean, zeros is odd, and I logged in with, with four A's as username and four A's as password. And what I noticed was, 
hmm, there's still zeros in there, so I'm pretty sure they have crafted a really interesting super high-tech encryption algorithm, and I'm going to find it out, right? Because that's what we do. And the other part that I noticed is, the first four bytes of every packet are the length of that, of that piece. Because if you just look at it, by the, four, by the first it's 16, and there are 16 bytes, and by, and by the thing on the bottom there are 14, and indeed there are 14 bytes. So the, and this also gives another clue, because it's little endian. You can immediately tell, because everyone recognizes little endian, right? So if we continue with this, and we just strip out the zeros, right? Because we don't care anymore about them. What you see is, this is what I get when I log in with four A's and four A's. Now, this doesn't look very interesting, so I decided I'm going to log in with four A's and four B's. And what you see is, the, the underlined numbers are the numbers that changed. And as you can see, the packet lengths, which I assumed were the, were the first four bytes, just by ma making educated guesses, because that is what you do and stuff like this. And what you see is, they don't change, so guess is pretty likely okay. Well, the other packets, hmm, there's stuff changing in there, and well, I'm, hmm, I'm not sure. But I can make an educated guess, because the data of the... Uh, yeah, uh, you can see that there is four times a 5a. And if you look at the previous slide, at the second packet of set 10, that's four, that's four times uh, 21. So that's likely the username, right? And I tested this theory because I was like, okay, now I'm going to do six a's, and indeed you see six a's, and it's nicely padded with zeros. That's because they love me. They want me to do this stuff. So if you continue with this, you see, hmm, this can't be hard, but instead of looking at the actual the encryption, data mangling, however you want to call it, what, what I did was, I was just making a guess, hmm, the password is always at offset 50 and 60, and the, and the password you see, it is, always, it is not random at all, right? Because the, if you just look at the difference between each byte, then you, I was like, hmm, this only skips one or two or four or seven, it's not random at all. So. I'm making a guess here. I was like, hmm, I know MD5 is 60 bytes, and, and, but if I write MD5 as hex digits, I know it's 32 bytes, right? So let's try. So I tried it, and if you, if you calculate MD5 hash of 4H, you will get 74, blah, blah, blah. And if you try to map this to the password, the 7 and the 4, the difference between them is 3. And F7, F4, the difference between them is 3. Hmm. That can't be a coincidence, right? Well, if we continue this guessing game, you will all, you, the, the, fourth, the fourth digit is a seven, after that is a three. And indeed, you will, you will see that the password repeats F7, F3 over there. And you, you will see that it then contains three, seven. So the next two bytes are indeed F3, F3 F7. So I was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure they use MD5 because, well, the, the difference, uh, we don't know how it's encoded, but what we do know is we understand that the difference between the, the, the bytes, if you will, it is the same, it's exactly the same. So if it usually means if they use super high-level cryptography, XOR, of course, who doesn't, and, the, and what, I, what I decided was, I'd, I was first, I was just writing down, right? Because I, you just assume that that F7, F3 goes to this MD5 stuff. We've just, yeah, we, we've just basically guessed that they used. So, but the next part was, well, hmm, how do you get from F7 to for 3, 7? And if you, just, uh, if you just write down bits, because that's what I do when, I'm, when, I'm, when, when I don't know, then what I started noticing is that only the top bits were different. And then I was like, hmm, I don't have the crypto skills to deal with this, but I remembered that a zero decodes to a zero, right? And how do you do it with XOR? Well, it's simple, you just plus a letter, you plus a number, and you XOR it with that number, and you end up with zero, because N, XOR N is zero. And if you just apply this knowledge, because the first packet I got is, I assumed is the key. I didn't know anything about it, but it changed. And if I just assume the very first byte is a key, and I plug it in as a 20 you see at the top, if I insert a 20, I take F7 plus 20, so 20, I end up exactly what I expected. So 
this Pegasus proves it might go a bit quick, but the slides are in the system, so you can look it up if you want the detail, and I want to get this boring stuff out of the way. But the interesting part of this is you can do this by hand just by thinking about the data. What do you see? You see a lot of zilch. You see data that is not random at all. So I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So then you continue. You have an idea how the cryptography works. You have an idea how the rest of the game continues. So what you do is you start dumping a lot of this stuff and you start looking at it, right? And um, the things I saw was if you look at the last four numbers here, you will see they just continue. So you get zero, one, two, all the times two, and it, it just goes on and on. So it's a sequence number because you need them in TCP, right? Very important. And the number before it, it just goes from zero all the way to nine, and then it resets again to zero, one, et cetera. And I was like, hmm, maybe that's the key they're using, because I know the key is 10 bytes. And indeed, it turned out the, 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 that number just says, that's the key you need to use. Is if, if it's FF, you obtain the key yourself. And that's basically all to it. But there were two numbers. I was like, what, what do they do? They looked random to me, real random, as if, Hmm, they don't differ by one every packet, because that isn't random. And what I noticed was, I didn't know anything at all. So I fired up OliDBG and IDA, I set a few breakpoints, and after a, a, a bit of coffee and a bit of patience, uh, they are checksums. And they have separate header and data checksums in this game. Hmm, that's interesting. And finally, the, the value after the number, for the, which you will see is always two, it, it's just a flag field. If it's two, the packet is encrypted. If it's free, it's a key. Simple as that. But then I noticed some packet I could not understand, and it's this. It never has any payload. What I show there is basically what you see. So I was like, hmm, that's boring. Uh, if I get them, the client tries to answer them with, with, oh, wait, the flag number is different. And then I noticed if I, uh, hmm, this is likely a keep alive. So thinking about what I saw, you see sequence numbers, you see keep alive packets. This is likely they decided hmm, UDP is the product of the future. And then they decided that UDP is actually pretty hard to use correctly uh, because things like reassembly of lost data is really useful. So my guess is they tried to invent their own TCP layer. They, well, they got the same problems as we got in in the 1980s, so they decided just to, just to, to push it over TCP and be done with it. But then again, I will never know. So if you, uh, if, and from now on, I'm going to ignore that boring header we had with the length and the keys and the flags. I'm also going to ignore the complete encryption stuff because, well, I don't care anymore. I figured it out, it works, and I'm now going to continue with the packet data itself. And what I noticed if, if I run around in this game, what you notice is when I get a lot of the packets from the client to the server, which must mean the client is trying to tell the server, we are moving in direction blah, we are at, we are at this coordinate or something in, among those lines. I do not know what it does, but I'm guessing. I'm making educated guesses, right? And it served quite well up to now, so I'm just going to continue. And what I noticed was, if you do this, then those numbers didn't make any sense at all. And I know the game is a little endian because the lengths are in the game. So what I did was, I just tried, I plugged them in as a floating point number, and suddenly they made sense. But those are not random floating point numbers, because the beauty of floating point numbers is if you take a complete, a complete nonsense number and you try to make it a float, it will become a complete nonsense float. It will be a very huge number, a very small number, or it just says, I don't know, it's zero, and you know, hmm, maybe it's not a float. So if you don't recognize it, it's likely a float. <laughs> so I did a lot of staring and drank a lot of coffee, of course. And what I noticed is I understand the packet header. It's, yeah, as you see, this isn't rocket science. All I did was I just created meg megabytes of logs and I tried to, to, to figure out the login process and went on from there. And what you see is you understand the packet header. You will understand that there are types of packets and you will then understand that some packets have some, yeah, s s they, have, they have a type and a subtype. And I think it has to do with the way packets are rooted inside the game, but don't know. Then I got fed up, because I don't know if you ever stared more than a day about hex dumps, but 
yeah, it tends to get boring, right? So I was like, let's create a tool. Let's create a tool to do this boring stuff for us. That's what I did. I created a tool called ROM Dump, and the name is uh, inspired by TCP Dump because it can dump protocols. And what I did was the first, the first input I get is a text file from the TCP flow. So what it does is it just takes the headers away from us and reassembles the stream and stuff, and it dumps it in a file. And the second part is an XML file which contains the definitions of the packets as you will. Well, what it does is, because we know the length, because TCP has this annoying tendency to buffer stuff, really annoying, so, and sometimes you will just get a packet that's incomplete, or, it, or the complete TCP packet you get contains three and a half packets, and you have to remember, huh, I need to understand the last 12 bytes, I need to, uh, it's very annoying, so I wrote this tool to help me with it. And what it does is, it just assembles a packet, does the decryption stuff and such, and it looks in the XML file, and it will continue. So, what I, so this, this is what it looks like. I will, look, I will first do the packet at the, at the bottom of the screen, the logon failure packet. Those names are just what I came up with because I thought they helped. And if you look at the top right, you can just say packet, name is login. It's, uh, the first field is a, is, a, is a U32, the name is type, and it has a fixed value of 4. And the second is some value which I call error. And if you look at, right, at, the, at, the, 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 at the bottom right, you will see that we get 0, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, so that's 4, okay, because little endian, and then we will get 65. So what the tool does is, is dumps this as packet is login failure, type is 4, error is 65. So that's much more fun than having to, to, to first get rid of that annoying encryption, obfuscating, coding, whatever you want to call it. And the second part is, suppose sometimes I, f I add a field, because I now know that error is not an error coder, but it is a bit field or something, then I can just apply this knowledge to my XML file. I can just say, okay, okay, dear tool, please process those 200 megabytes of packet dumps for me, and I will, so I will immediately start to see things, because now I have a tool which helps me for it. And if I ever manage to figure out what that unknown field of the account name and password was, I can just plug it in, run the tool, and I will see things. So that's really useful. I really recommend to, if you do this sort of stuff, think about making such tools. I know they're there, I know there's all stuff, but we will get, we will get there while making custom stuff. It's always more fun. So, as I, as I said, some packets can be nested. So you have, you have a packet which I call client request, and the idea of a client request is it's always sent from the client to the server, it always has that fixed type, and contained in this packet is a sub-packet which says, I want to move, I want, I want to quit the game, I want to say something to the game world, I want to do whatever. So I was like, hmm, I can, I can, I, yeah, I can nest things in my parser, right? Because Everyone likes creating parsers. So if you look at the data at the bottom right, you, uh, it's, it's exactly the same packet as I was illustrated with the, with the floating point stuff. And well, that doesn't make any sense. But if you just, if you just create, a, create a definition and you just say, hmm, let's try float here, and you will see s values that make sense, you will very quickly get the basic ID of the protocol. Because if you understand the headers and the ID what the makers had, you, you will know all the code is layered, right? Or at least I hope so. I really hope it just don't blow structs over a network socket, but who knows. But there must be some pattern to this, and we can exploit that. So, well, wh when I was doing this tool, I made a grave mistake. I wrote it to C++. That was done. You really shouldn't do it. And uh, after this, I learned Python, and Python is much more fun to do this stuff. In. And the reason I'm stressing this point is when, I, when you create tools like this, you want to add features. Because first time, yeah, you can decode structs and stuff. That's really cool. But you, uh, eventually, you will learn that, for example, an account name is always, say, 64 bytes or so. The, so the moment you start seeing one of them, you know this is like these 64 bytes, right? Because they're always 64 bytes, so there's no reason to assume you don't. So you want to have constants. 
You also want enumerations, because enumerations are cool and everyone uses them. So what you want to do is, you want to add, uh, oh, uh, login error, f login code one is uh, password error, login two is account banned, login three is whatever. Then you just want to see them. You do, not, you do not want to have to look them up at the same time. And also, you will need structured types, at least I did. And the, the reason is, uh, the item structure of this game is really complex, right? We've seen and lots, lots of stuff on the screen. It has to go to your client in some way. So what I did was, I wanted to add structs to this, because all items will likely have exactly the same format, because those programmers are lazy, and they should be. What you want to do is you want to figure it out one time, and then you want to use this everywhere. So you need structured types. You really you, know, you need arrays because arrays are uh, everyone loves them. You 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 will see you will see the data that belongs together. But the other interesting part is I wanted I have transformation support in there. What that does is I sometimes you will you will find a packet type or something and it's compressed because yeah it's a natural game makes sense to compress stuff so once you figure it out i will get into that shortly how you can do this but you want to be able to tell your dump tool from uh, hi the data that's coming is compressed with algorithm xyz and no transform it for me and if you implement it right in other words you do not write this tool in c then it's really easy to do because well it took me a few clever hacks to put it in. And also, you want annotations. And what I mean by that is, if you log into this game, it will, it will say, hi, you have completed quest one, two, three, four. And I was like, hmm, I have no idea what quest one, two, three, four is. So I was like, how, the, how can I learn this? I will get next to the, in the next slide that you can, there uh, are uh, really clever ways to look it up, but you want your dump tool to know if you have this number, you need to look it up in a table, and I want to see the, 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 the human readable form, because computers like Quest 1, 2, 3, 4, and I want to know what is really in there. And you also want dynamic annotations, and this game works. I'm, I'm, I'm actually just walking ahead now, but this game works by on an object basis. The server says, hi, if there's an object over there, everything that is not static is an object. And the IDs of the objects are random. Yeah, they're actually sequential, so that's not really random, but, but you can't predict them. It, it, at least I can't. So what, it, what, what you do is it will just say, hi, hi, I want you to show object one, two, three, object type one, two, three, four at, at some position, and I'm going to call it object two. And what, what a dynamic annotation in the tool does is, everywhere it sees object ID two, it will say, aha, that's that door, because it knows it was a door, so you can show that it's a door. I will give examples of this. But first, how the request them item as ID, and I touched them previously. And w the one of the things you need to realize is, games are typically, and everything that we do, is it's just numbers, right? And there's a database and it has its numbers. So I was like, it's really useful when you start figuring out uh, inventory management and you just click around items in your backpack and see what they do. You want to see, hmm, this, this, I have this potion and I think the game must have it in this data file. So what's the ID of the potion? It must have an identifier. And it turns out that if you just Google around a lot, the game has ways of just linking an object to another player, so you can show someone, hi, I have this awesome sword, and they will see it in chat, and if they click it, they will see a, they will see a model of it. And it turns out that so those things typically use exactly the same IDs. And there are websites, item databases, if you will, and they also use the same ID, because why not? Why should we invent something else? So what I, what I decided to do was, first I used the MacBan tool, and what it does is you feed a data file in it, and it dumps out the internal tables of the game, and it has some tools to, to do interesting stuff with it. And I also wrote, wrote my own, because why not? And I was bored of looking at hex dumps for a while, so I wanted to do something different. But it really helps if you know that an item you want you are interested in because you pick it up or whatever. You, it helps if you know it has a certain ID. So, and the also interesting part of it is, if you have hex dump support, that you can just dump all packages as hex, you can just search for it. Because if you search in hex data for the ID, you will immediately identify all, pa all packages that do stuff with items. And that is so much easier than, than just looking them one by one. 
So I was continuing, and it really got nice. And then I got a packet, and I was like, hmm, there's no pattern in this at all. But what I like to do, I print stuff, and I just grab a pencil, a lot of coffee, and and an evening, and I start just just drawing lines, annotating things as I think how they work. That's what I used to do, and that's what, why I like the XML stuff so much. But one of the things I noticed was that fit, the data looks random. It's, yeah, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. I had a lot of characters, a lot of different terms, a lot of settings, and this, the, the pieces of the name were there, pieces of the, pieces of the inventory, item IDs were there, but not everything. So I was like, hmm, this looks like something compressed. And what I did was, I was like, I'm going to use my big friends, Oli, DBG, and Ida, and I'm going to learn what the protocol does. And I think I'm reasonably certain they didn't invent this, this protocol itself. And it really takes a lot of time to take a lot of assembly and try to learn an, a, 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 a compression algorithm, but it's really fun to do. I, thi I think you should do it. But the problem is, when I got this, it's, I got 100 kilobytes of data, and there were fields I could identify. I had the inventory for a part, but 100 kilobytes is a lot. It's really a lot. My first computer didn't even have that, that amount of memory. So I was like, hmm, I need some way to figure out how I can, how do I continue? I don't, I don't know enough about this data. But first, I was actually quite fed up with my capturing setup. And the reason is, those tools are good, but this game, it's a distributed game, right? As in, there are multiple servers, there are a lot of backends, and the if you log into the game, you go, will get redirected to another server, and you, that, that server can decide, no, no, you're going to this server, and you need to log in again, and you will have a lot of connections, and you need to look at a lot of state. So what I decided to do was, I was like, hmm, I'm not interested in, the, I, I, want, I want to capture this in a bit better fashion. So I decided, I know how the basic protocol works, I'm going to write a proxy. This is what I did, and what I did was, it's a tool, it just listens on TCP, and it connects to the real server, and it just forwards your data to the server, what's come back, forwards back to the client, and it writes everything in a really nice logging file format. And I know they want me to do this, because you can just set in a server any file, you can say, no, no, this is the server IP you should be contacting. So I'm, well, it logs stuff, it, it first keep alive, it does that, and if it sees a server redirect, it's like, no, no, you want to talk to me, and it redirects it nicely to its own IP address. And the client on the other side don't know, client on the other side don't care, it just looks, oh, this looks like a valid IP address, even for, even for it's in a private IP space, I'm just going to connect to it. So what, and this turned out to be really handy, it's, and it's undetectable as far as I know, because I didn't run this on my own, on my gaming PC, I just run it on some, on some Linux box somewhere in my network. And the, the nice part is you can do really cool stuff with this. I'm not getting into details, but I think you get the idea now, because you can just rewrite packets, and you can just lie about them. You can, you've died, mm, I didn't see that packet, goodbye. Of course, I haven't tried this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have this tool, I can make nice logs, but entering the game world is 400 kilobytes of data, and that excludes the data that decompresses. So the raw data you get is 400 kilobytes. That's a whole lot. It's really a lot. And I was like, hmm, I'm pretty sure most of this data is not relevant, but no idea what I could do. So what I did was, I wanted, to, I need to influence data, right? Of this 100 kilobyte structure, I need to change things, and I need to look, I need to learn how the how the how the game reacts to it. So I was like, let's write a server. <laughs> so what I did was, I just uh, I just uh, fumbled something together. It's really terrible, but it works good enough. And I had this idea: if I'm, do you know what? I'm going to plug a Python script language in it because Python is good. But then I was like, hmm, if I just type broadcast and on some array of bytes, well, yeah, well, well we are well back to the packet dumps we wanted to avoid. So I was like, let's not do it, because we have this nice XML file. And if we can use it to dump, we can also use it to create packets. And we can go uh, further, as all my projects like to do. W what I did was I created a tool called MKDEV, also in C++, which is also a very stupid idea. 
because who passes XML in C? But then again, what it does is it just takes this file and it creates source code files, one of the packet data itself, and those packet files are just, they just create classes, and you can just uh, uh, put in there, oh, I want to, I want to send a, 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 and create object with this and this data, and I want to send it now, and all this packing and encrypting and stuff, it's all handled by this code. And it also creates Python bindings. So I can just hook it in my Python interpreter. I can say, hi, I want you to send create object with this and this arguments, and it broadcasts it to all the clients it has. That's really awesome, and you will see it soon. So how, what does this look like? Now, I have this packet display yellow text. You, I am sure you have no idea what it does. And what, I, and what you can do is you can just turn it to the server on some port. You can just copy paste your text in there. And what happens is, the, what happens is you will see yellow text on the client screen. But you can also mess with the parameters because hmm, I'm, sh I'm not sure what unknown for does. So I'm going to type something else and I'm going to look at what, what, what does the client show. And this is really fun to do because you can just change things and you can just observe what happens and you really learn quickly about it and you, you are not you are not harming anyone, right? Because the, well, the game servers, uh, wherever they are, they are just humming along. They don't know what you do, it's because it's your own server. But there was a snatch. I was like, hmm, you know what? I'm just going to, to put those 400 kilobytes of data to the, to the client, and it crashes. Yay. Yeah, the client is, uh, if you've played this game, you understand. Maybe it wasn't that bad. Yeah. It could have used a bit more, uh, more Q&A, maybe. But, but so what I did was, I was like, hmm, if I just put sleeps in there, well, it took uh, a lot of time, but I managed to log in, and then I just started to remove stuff I hoped was not important, and step by step, I got to somewhere I could log into the game world, and I could do my packet anal anal analysis. So I'm now going to show you a small demo, so please pray with me, the stars align that it doesn't crash, because I won't say it has happened before, because it has. But the packet I'm going to show is if you the game works in objects, right? And if you create an object and you are and you are like a a, a, an, an, a player character, you can customize your character a bit. And the game uses some packet and it tells you, okay, the the the, the hair the hair looks like this, and the 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 the, the, the beard style is that, and what sort of stuff. So what I. I Eventually, I knew this packet does it, but I don't know what the, what the 32 bytes do, what it does. So, oh my god, it's still up. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to start my server, which has the nice name Open Room because I really suck at names. And yeah, well, open projects are popular, right? So I was like, hmm, maybe if I adapt this one. So I'm going to log in with a username and password. Uh, I hope it's visible. But as you can see, uh, the server starts seeing stuff. And we are, yay, we have our own server with the nice name Solitude. Because it's not really an online game anymore, is it? <laughs> so now I'm going to log in with, uh, with a reverse engineer, because that's what we do. And in the meanwhile, you will see the log on the back end. That's why you need logging. You want, to so you want to know that stuff is going on. I'm not going to talk about what the packets are actually like. I will be presenting a short one on one, the overview of the protocol, and you can get the rest of my GitHub. But uh, yeah, did I mention the game is slow? Ah, there it is. Now, as you can see, we're an engineer at 32C3, because I can send whatever I want, so I can send guild names. It's really fun. Oops. And this is how the game is supposed to look like. And now I'm, j I'm, I'm going to zoom in on my face. And yeah, I really haven't. So now I'm just going to tell that to the stuff. I, and I'm going to enter Python stuff, right? Uh, first, I'm going to set a variable because variables are nice. Then I'm going to set a lot of data, and this is the data I just sniffed from somewhere, and I'm going to, uh, and I'm going to modify this. But first, I'm just going to send it. So what you see here is, 
nothing happens. Oh, that's boring, but that's good because it's exactly the same data as I sent when I created this character. So now I'm just going to say, hmm, unknown 5. I have no idea what it does, but I'm going to send it to 255 because 255 is a nice value. Or to the, uh, uh, in a, uh, usually just testing extreme values. If it's 10, make it 200. If it's 200, make it 3. It really helps to figure out the, 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 yeah, what kind of value it is. So now I'm going to send it to 255, and now I'm going to send the object appearance packet again. And as you can see, my character has lost all its hair. Now, I can continue with this. I can also send unknown, un this unknown character. And now my beard is another color. So I know now that the beard is somehow linked to unknown 12 and the character hair is linked to unknown 5. But what you can also do is you can also create arbitrary characters. And I'm now going to quickly do that because sometimes you know that, that, that commands interact with other, with other things. So now I want to create a, a monster and I'm going to do it. And, oh, of course, I messed up. Ah, you see, we have friends. <laughs> well, that looks scary, right? But the good part is, I, I figured out the object died command. Bye-bye. <laughs> you can just kill it. <laughs> and then I had this unknown 92E thing, and I didn't know what it was, so I'm just going to send it. And it sparkles. Sparkling is good. <laughs> and sparkling in a game knows you can loot it. So now if I loot it, my server, I, mean, I guess I can show this as well, I, if I, you, you will see that, hey, I get an unknown 1FF packet. So I know, aha, unknown 1FF must mean you want to loot, uh, and now I'm supposed to send to the client which kind of cool items he has. But well, that's about it for the demo. Let's hope it doesn't die. So now I'm quickly going to cover the protocol because I'm um, running out of time. So how the game works is you, there are three layers of servers. You have a login server, it and it just says, hi, who are you? Account name, password, and if it doesn't match, it's like, go away. If you make it through it, you get to a portal server, and the portal server just says, hi, those are all the game servers you can connect to. And if you then connect to a server, you end up with a specific game server. So you always have three hops, and that's why I wrote the proxy tool, because, well, it's, uh, it's a much nicer if, you, if someone solves all this problem for you. Now, the other thing to notice is this game has a lot of commands. Oh, really a lot. Almost everything has a command. If you join a team, there's a, there's a command to, sell you, to tell you, hi, the join went perfectly. There's a command to tell you, okay, you need to add this to your message log. There's a command to tell you, oh, in your, in your player character, you need to add this guild name. There's a command to tell you, oh, the user interface needs to add this guild name. There's a package that gets sent which says, oh, this, this guild, by the way, has these and these members, and it goes on and on. And that's the nice thing about having a server. You can just do it step by step and see what happens when you send it, because I don't know about you, but if I get like 40, 40 packets, maybe 20 of which are relevant, I don't know. And if I can just send them myself using this scripting stuff, it's much easier to figure out. Because there are over 200 packet types, I know about 150 of them. As I said, it's object-based. Everything that's not static is an object. So things like doors that can be removed are objects. Things you can guard are objects. Uh, NPCs, bosses, that sort of stuff, all objects. Player characters have appearances, and that's just a physical appearance, and you, you have separate commands over how their gear looks, and positioning, fighting, everything has a command. If you just look at the monster and it, and it looks back, it has a command. If, if it changes stance from, I'm a hostile, I'm going to kick you, it has a command. It's, it, it, the, the, if it says, hmm, I'm going to hit you, it has a command. If the hit matches, it has a command. It's, it's really a lot. So, what I learned was this 100 kilobyte character info packet, it influences the UI. And that's really cool, because what you can do is, you can just put in there, okay, we have, uh, we have 100 kilobytes of data, right? But in this 100 by kilobytes of data, the game world, the objects, the player you can move has nothing to do with it. 
and the quest nodes, which the client nodes, which quests are pending. So if you log in, that 100 kilobytes just has a lot of bad bits because everyone loves bits too. And what it does is it will just tell the client, okay, this quest you can is not is not done yet, and this quest is done yet, and the client figures out what it needs to show. It's really interesting. Client security really sucks in this game. If you make a mistake and send a byte too much, it crashes. That's bad, right? If you if you mess up this character info packet, is the, you get an, an exception in the, on the stack. Well, it's really cool because well, well we, we can execute code with this if we can influence the server. And I expect the server isn't really much better, but I didn't dare try it because, well, there's also some information regarding it there. It tells you your MAC address, it tells you your video card, your operating system, stuff like that. I don't know why. Maybe if they wanted to have an ID of the of what you of what your clients were, but I can spoof them as well. So I was like, now what? Because I want to release this stuff, but I sought legal help. And the reason I did this is because I don't like getting sued. So there was some guy who was who had a talk that awesome Simon was sued for two billion dollars. I don't want to give a talk about being sued for two million euros. So I was like, I'm going to talk to a lawyer. Most of them say, uh, don't go there. Oh, that's stupid, that's boring. So I met Arnold Engelfried and he was really helpful because what he told me was after a few meals, because he's one of the few person I know who is also an engineer, a software engineer, and he's also a lawyer. It's a crazy combination, but hey, all the better for us. And he says, well, those tools you made are really interesting as long as you can, you, your goal should not be cheating. If your goal is cheating, you, yeah, you are, you're acting illegally, right? Because, well, that's, that's not good. Y and if you do this in private, you don't release anything, you can do whatever you want, but your goal can never be cheating. So I want to express my goal never was cheating. So as he continued, he said, okay, well, the you shouldn't release the server code. The other tools are okay. They're nice, they illustrate a point, they're interesting. But the server, well, they can see it as competition, you know. And I was like, why? It doesn't crash as often. But <laughs> the, the suggestion was don't do it. Really do not release it. And I was like, I'm a bit ashamed of what the code looks like, and I, I do not intend to release it, and it's not because I don't lo love open source and stuff, but I don't want to get sued, and if anyone here has contacts with, with, the, with the developer or publisher of this game, and it's like, okay, you can do it, I will, I will. And if they ever take the official servers on offline, so you can't play the game, I will immediately dump everything I have on GitHub. So I wanted to thank you. All the stuff I've been talking about is on my GitHub account. And there's also a lot more stuff on there because the item stuff is in a lot of different repository, but who knows. But if you have any questions, now is the time. And I also have email and stuff, so. Thank you for this uh, very insightful talk. We now have about 10 minutes for question and answer. So if you want to uh, ask a question, proceed to this inner microphones. And yeah, we start right now. Uh, yeah, that right microphone there. Hi, thanks for the talk. Did you ever accidentally send packets to the server and see it react in strange ways? Uh, yes, I did. And it, uh, it uh, was sorry, OK. Sorry. Uh, Everybody who is now leaving, just be a little bit more quiet so everybody can get the question and answer. Thank you. But yes, I did. And one of the things I wanted to know is if, the, if it really matters if the client sends all the data it does. And it turned out it doesn't, but that's code I'm definitely going to release because you know what you can do with it, right? <laughs> OK, is there a question on that microphone or no question? OK, then another one there. Um, I wanted to know how long you've been working on this. Like, was it last week in a caffeine-fueled nightmare? Have you been working on this for several months now? Uh, this uh, project took two years. 
but it was on and off because I uh, well I did suffer from from yeah other interests like life and stuff. So <laughs> it was it was really ups and downs. <laughs> but of I can say that overall I think if I could do this full time it was about uh, four to six months I guess because if you once you get you get into it it really goes fast. Okay, there is a question from the internet. Yeah, uh, actually there are two questions right now. Um, the first one is uh, if there is any kind of end-to-end -end encryption or authentication between the client and the server. Um, yes, XOR and PLUS. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, the second question is if you could, in theory, spawn items on a real server. <laughs> I knew that question was coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I want to say about this is the following. I, I know about players within the game who have managed to duplicate items and stuff. You can do that, or you could. I don't know if you still can because I don't play the game anymore. And I have this idea if you don't want to let me play the game anymore. But you, most of it seems to be bugs on the server side. Because if the client is convinced he has some item, and surprise, surprise, you can lie about that, then I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's not rock solid. I think you can do it, but you just most people find it out by just clicking an item seven million times, and you can script in the game in Lua. And some people just made scripts to do something twenty times in a row, and the server just gave up and said, "Okay, whatever." So <laughs> it, it has happened. I don't know if it's fixed, but it has, it has happened. And Are there more oh. questions? Yes, there. Um, hello. Oh. Um, did you try these things on other MMOs, or is this a unique case to this broken piece of software? No, what you can do is you can do this basically on any game you want. You can also, uh, for example, if you have an SQL server, you could use some like these techniques, because it it's basically boils down to understanding the data. And that's why I try to, to talk more about the, the, the approach I took than the actual game, because the game, well, it's less interesting than the approach. So, but if you're volunteering, I would really like to know how, how the Old Republic works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any more questions? Yeah. On that microphone? Okay, hi. Uh, interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, actually, I'm a game developer, and <laughs> at the moment, I'm. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to. <coughs> not a massive multiplayer game, but uh, an online game. So, mm -hmm. do you have any advices for me to make um, you, your work harder? <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the things I think you should really consider is people can and will do this given they're sufficiently bored with the game as I was. And one of the, and I think that what you should do is you, yeah, if it were up to me, I would just release the protocol and say, haha, have fun. But the, re the reason is eventually you will figure it out. Eventually you can learn how it works and you should design with that in mind. You should design one, hmm, if some crazy person sends complete quest 20 times, Maybe I should check for it. You should, you should never trust data the client sends. You should always, you should always consider it as, well, this can be influenced. You should, always, you should also think about the fact that maybe someone did something evil and the client never got all data you sent. Do you instantly kick it off your network? I think you should design for that. There is another question from the internet. Yes, uh, the question is, have you have ever had contact with the developer? I'm sorry, could you repeat if, it? If you've had contact with the developer of the game. Uh, no, and the reason I didn't is I tried to contact some guys of the, uh, there were some communities, right? And everything I sent, uh, and I had this idea if they were connected somehow, because both being in German and stuff. But the problem was I never could find anything, and I do not know how to contact the, the publisher, because it's really a, a large company based in Berlin. I'm really happy the Congress isn't there. And, the <laughs> and uh, well, I don't know where to begin, so I was hoping maybe someone here knows how I can get in. I don't have any experience with that stuff. Any more questions? Last chance? <laughs> okay, then, 
Yeah, thank you again for sharing our, your awesome work with us. Really nice. Uh,